Uh, I'm Diane Meyer, uh, Conservation Chair for the Sierra Club, and we're sponsoring this presentation tonight. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the Sierra Club, we, we just, this fall, last fall, we celebrated our 20th anniversary of doing things in the community, and we've given pro public programs for the last 20 years, and um, we're, we're active in the community in other ways, serving on committees and showing up at hearings and things like that. So there is some information on the back table if there's anything there you'd like to uh, take. And there's a sign-in sheet if you haven't already signed in. And um, we have uh, two upcoming programs. This Thursday night at 7 o'clock here at the Davis Library is uh, Then and Now, a history of wolves in the UP. Tom Weesey is a retired DNR wildlife biologist, and he'll uh, be providing an update on hunting and depredation concerns as well. So we encourage you to come to that. Um, and then on Thursday, April 11, Roger Blanchard, who is a chemistry professor at LSSU, We'll talk about gasoline prices, oil supplies, Bakken, Eagle Ford, and so much more. You may not know what Bakken and Eagle Ford are, but it's about the, the um, shale in Montana. And so he'll be explaining uh, the current status of U.S. oil supplies and uh, the reason that gas prices are so high. He's been studying oil uh, situation for 25 years and published a book on it, so he knows what he's talking about. So we encourage you to come. Um, we're, we're happy to welcome our speaker tonight, Neil Moran. And the, the idea for tonight's program, I want to mention, came when we had our 20th anniversary celebrations last fall. One of the things we did was show a film called Getting Real About Food and the Future. And this was about food security in local locations, about raising your own food and regional food and trying to make, make it secure in your area so that you don't need so much from other places. And at that meeting, so many people were interested in gardening and focused on talking about all the problems they had growing vegetables in the eastern UP. So it sounded like we needed a support group for gardeners. So we decided we would have a couple presentations. <laughs> and this is our second gardening presentation. And Neil, um, many of you probably already know, Neil is a horticulturist and has taught horticulture. And he's had years of gardening experience that he's been sharing with people. He has written three books, and his books are available here for sale. And tonight he'll be sharing his secrets and tips about uh, gardening in, in the Eastern UP. So thank you, Neil, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. I think we have an interest in gardening in the community. I don't like that. Um, many people feel a little frustrated with gardening. Okay. Well, we're going to try to. We're going to try to fix that tonight, okay? A um, few things to mention. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to split this up into kind of two parts and have like an intermission, I guess you might say. And we're going to do a raffle drawing for some items related to gardening, of course. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that, you can. Um, with my wife, Sherry, is signing people up. Um, so we'll do that and then go, I think we're going to go to about 8.30, quarter after 8, 8.30, somewhere in there. If you have questions along the way, you know, go ahead and ask. I'd like this to be, you know, interactive. I want to help, you know, solve any of your problems or concerns. And at the same time, I don't know everything about gardening and, you know, feel free to share things you've done that are working, you know, especially in this climate, you know, our short season and so forth. So um, for you folks that I do see some unfamiliar faces here, I've, uh, I guess my claim to fame is I wrote a book in 95, 1995, North Country Gardening. And, um, and it, it, that book 
tell us about how to garden mostly in this kind of climate in this northern area where our days uh, our growing season are a little bit shorter right things like that um, I got the idea of doing that because I came up here from the thumb back in 78 79 um, I got a plot to garden and pretty soon found out that this wasn't going to be quite as easy as sound. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured out a few things along the way, and I'd like to share some of those thoughts tonight and, and ideas. Um, but this is Gardening 101, so I'm going to take you right, you know, from the basics. Maybe try to look at this as, as you know, a recipe for, a, you know, cake or bread or whatever, where I'm giving you the ingredients to grow a, a good garden. And, you know, it really... More and more lately I've been thinking about, um, you know, how I'd like to see people to be successful uh, growing gardens. I know they get frustrated. We've got community gardens. Some of those look real good. Some, you know, you can see that maybe there's been some frustration with weeds or whatever. Things not ripening. In fact, I heard tonight somebody said they've been here four years and still haven't <laughs> gotten much, you know, so maybe weeds and a few tomatoes. So. Hopefully, we're going to, since they hopefully, we're going to remedy that problem here tonight. So, some of these tips. Okay, it all kind of starts with the soil. And I want to explain these things. I'm not going to get, you know, real deep into, deep, so to speak, into uh, plant science. But you should know some of this basic stuff here. You know, we got clay, the smallest particle, holds water well. You know, if anybody here gardening clay, they know that when it dries, it's very hard. Um, sand, on the other hand, you know, kind of the other problem, doesn't hold water so well. Um, the advantage up here, at least, is that it does dry out and kind of warms up uh, quick in the in the spring, so that's that's a good thing. Um, and then sandy loam is really kind of a mix of all that, um, plus the silt, and that's really the ideal uh, soil that, that you want. So um, in this area, you know, there's some all clay. I'm in kind of a sandy loam out uh, of Riverside Driveway, the clay road. Um, you know, going kind of west, it seems to get to be real clay over on Brimley Way sand, right? So so what are we going to do about it if we got that clay or sand? So what would you amend or what would you do to improve a clay soil? What might you add, you know, or sand. Compost. Compost. Okay, Peabas. compost. How about a sandy soil? What would you add to that to make it a little clay. more <laughs> so yeah, in both cases we want to use an amendment, compost, you know, well-rotted livestock manure. Um, and another thing I want to do tonight, and you know, by all means ask me if I'm not explaining it. I want to be practical, you know, I want to give you an idea and then you don't really know locally what to do or where to get it. So I want to be real practical so when you you know you leave here tonight you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna go here to get this and that and you know really do this. Um, so you know compost, well rotted livestock, manure, these are good amendments and um, you know locally you want to might want to see a farmer. Some people give it away, some people sell it pretty reasonably. There's a guy out on Six Mile Road. I don't know if he'll be selling it again this year, but Harley Boone um, has got some very, very rotted uh, manure that really works well. Um, and also at the uh, uh, city compost. People familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the city compost site. That's a real nice place to get um, you know, good compost. Um, I've gotten the habit of just screening it all now because it's, you know there's a lot of stones. This is kind of the upfront, you know, work involved in, a, in gardening. And, you know, just trying to emphasize here that, you know, if you want a good garden, you really need to do this. So, uh, you know, only amend the soil if you want a good garden. Okay, so, you know, you've got a fairly big plot or, you know, 
10 by 20, 30 by 40, you know, what do you want to do here? Should I test my soil? Um, if I do, what am I testing it for? Anybody know what are the things we pH. test the soil for? PH. Yeah, pH. Nitrogen. 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 Yeah, if it's acidic or alkaline. Um, what if you don't test it? <laughs> are you going to jail? No. Am I going to do anything about it? No. Uh, if you don't test it, what I always kind of recommend is go ahead and add your amendments and chances are you're going to need nitrogen anyways because nitrogen leaches through the soil so every soil test I've ever gotten has said boost up to nitrogen because nitrogen does its hold in the soil, phosphorus does um, and potash to some extent so you know if you don't want to bother getting a soil test or do that uh, I recommend that you do but if you don't another thing you could add is lime um, I don't think you could go wrong in this area to add lime to make it a little less acidic. So, on the other hand, if you want to get a, you know, want to have a soil test done, you can go to the um, MSU extension for, I think it used to be $15, but they will give you a box. Um, you'll take it home. It has instructions how to take that sample. You put it in there and you just send it off from home. Two or three weeks later, they'll send you back a real nice detailed uh, analysis of your soil. Plus, they'll, they'll recommend, you put on there what you're trying to grow and they'll recommend uh, you know what you need to, to balance the soil to grow that crop. So they are very, very good uh, tests. Yes? Is there a certain timeline like when you should add those things? Like, is it like, I don't know if you're, if you're direct planting something, it's like how, how early would you want to add it? So you're not like burning the, the plant, you know, it's like. Yeah, I think if you're, um, you know, if you're adding the right amount, you know, the right rate, um, you can do it pretty much just prior to planting. It's not gonna hurt anything, so. You know, like I say, as long as you're using the right rate, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, so. Okay, anything else? This is some basic stuff that I think is really important. Just something you want to kind of have in your, in your mind as you're growing things in, in different stages of development and so forth. And we're talking here vegetables or flowers, grass, trees, um, nitrogen. You know, kind of know what these things do. And then when you look at that box, you know, that you're going to get if, if you choose to get chemical fertilizers or organic fertilizers for that matter. You know, look at that nutrient <laughs> composition and realize that nitrogen is going to give you good plant growth, kind of a green up. Um, one drawback is the plants go and go and go. And if you're, you're growing something like uh, tomatoes, um, squash, pumpkins, sometimes will grow and grow and grow and not produce any fruit. And I've heard a lot of people say, geez, you know, I grew these cucumbers, there's no cucumbers. It's tomatoes and no tomatoes. You know, at some point, that green growth needs to, just keep that in mind, that green growth needs to stop and you want to go into, you know, flower blossom and, and production of fruit. And that's kind of where phosphorus comes in. Um, it's good for root development and seedlings and young plants later on will encourage blooms. It kind of does both. It's good for root development. Again, think, um, you know, if you're seed starting at home, um, <clears throat> phosphorus is a good way to kind of get that root, get those roots developed. Um, so I use kind of a high phosphorus content when I'm starting out my seedlings right now. I've got a few things started, um, rather be flowers or, um, you know, vegetable transplants. Um, you want kind of a high phosphorus. You don't need a lot of nitrogen, you know, when the seedlings are real small. Um, backing up a little bit, nitrogen, you know, is good for a nice green up um, for your grass in the spring. So, you know, think high nitrogen. So you might think high nitrogen for that, you know, maybe low nitrogen if you're thinking more like transplanting your perennials, um, you know, starting seedlings where you want good growth development. You don't want your young plants just to kind of take off without, you know, roots are really the foundation of those plants. If you're, anybody uh, grow things inside in the spring? I'll say, okay, so keep that in mind. Um, 
And then potash, you don't have to, or potassium aids in plant hardiness, overall health. Just make sure it's, a, you know, it's in your blend of, of fertilizer and it should be. <clears throat> um, minor nutrients are just that, they're needed in lesser amounts. Um, still a good idea though to make sure, you know, just kind of, there again, just kind of make sure that it's in that fertilizer bag, you know, excuse me, rather be organic or inorganic. Um, I worked out at the prison for several years. Um, we had a commercial greenhouse and we started petunias. And I brought, bought a blend, you know, from a company and which I thought was gonna be fine, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And the leaves were real, real yellow on the plants. That first year was kind of an experimental year for us. I mean, really yellow. I mean, and uh, so a guy from MSU came in and he looked at that bag and he said, there's no iron in, in this. Uh, composition and, and iron is also something that helps plants green up so a lack of iron or, or no iron you're going to get what they call iron chlorosis or it becomes chlorotic so so just make sure um, you know your blend has those minor nutrients and some of those nutrients are found you got well in around soil. here you should have plenty of nitrogen or uh, iron in it should yeah. pardon me so if you got a well <coughs> Well water, right. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's normally not, especially outside. Eh? You know, it's not a problem. Uh, and if you're not using city water, so yeah. Speaking of well water, if you have Culligan water softener and it, you know, it softens the water, goes through a salt bath. Uh, my zucchini leaves last year were like sunburned. It looked like and really. They, I never. I only had a couple of zucchinis. Hmm. And I think it was watering with that water. And I can't just, well, I can, but it's going to be expensive to, to get a tap straight from my well without it going through the house first, you know? Okay. Can you well, capture rainwater? I, I don't. I, I can, no. Yeah, I should. That might be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's all for bad. So. All right, good. Any other questions? <coughs> pH, um, well, I wanted to pass these around. Do you know there enough there? Mm -hmm. Is there enough there? I don't know. I'm I hope so. Really <laughs> 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 yeah, does it matter? Yeah, it certainly does. Some plants, um, you know, just do better at a, at a different pH range than others. Um, you know, the extreme example is blueberries, right? They need more of an acidic soil, which is going to be a high number or low number. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a low number, 4.5 or 5. So, um, a balanced pH is what's going to allow your nutrients to work most efficiently. That's why it's important. And if it's not in balance, the nutrients aren't doing, you know, all that they can. <laughs> um, and again, in this area, you know, I think you can expect the soils, if, if you had to guess, maybe a little bit on the city side. I don't think, like I said, you didn't want it that. And like I say, I like to keep this sort of practical. Because I know again, the soil test can be a hassle or whatever. You can't go wrong with a little line. Just make sure you apply it to the rate that they recommend it. So, but if you you know you do decide you want to go with strictly blueberries, azaleas, rhododendrons, or something, just remember that it doesn't hurt to take a look at a at a pH chart. Flowers don't mind it a little bit on the acidic side. So, and I just learned about. about Low release fertilizer, I believe it's all organic. It's called polytone. You may have heard of that. Yeah. And that's um, the lady I talked to, actually, is from Poly Planning and Plucking down in, in Harbor Springs. She swore by it and uh, they use a lot on their ornamental <coughs> shrubs and flowers and stuff. So maybe something to keep in mind if you're how many flower gardeners do you have here? <coughs> all right. Vegetable gardeners? All right, both. <laughs> you do one, you can do the other. So, yeah, so this, um, you know, breaks it down. 
and um, you know you can take a look at this we won't go into this any further but just remember that sulfur will lower the pH lime will bring it up so just be a little careful with sulfur because it is toxic too much of that <coughs> so always follow those rates you know those recommended uh, rates of application instructions <laughs> and then of course uh, above that I, I put the uh, major and minor nutrients so you have that as kind of a reference um, try to keep those things in mind I think that's really important try to think about you know what stage of growth your plants in um, yeah if you're putting lime on the lawn don't even get close to the blueberries because it'll wash in okay yeah that's a good point yeah yeah, same with uh, herbicides <laughs> <the trees. laughs> Yeah, stuff will, stuff will leach down in. So. Yeah, I got to be careful about this stuff. So. Another thing about fertilizing, that, that, you know, this is kind of my personal belief, is better to under-fertilize than over-fertilize. And another thing I wanted to, to mention, too, was um, I kind of skirted by it a little bit, but on soil, I mean, soil is really where it's at. And there's all kinds of things going on in that soil that we can't see. If you ever had a microscope in there, it's just amazing. You probably wouldn't want to touch soil, maybe, but <laughs> it's, it's teeming with mic, uh, microbes or you know, microscopic organisms that um, they're doing some pretty amazing things in the soil. So um, another practical sort of consideration is, you know, don't overdo it with these chemical fertilizers. That's killing those microbes. That's why organic fur, uh, gardening is so popular these days, is because it kind of leaves that alone. It lets all that happen. So, um, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Same with tilling. You know, tilling the soil, of course, we have to do that to get, you know, the ground worked out. But overdoing that is just disturbing all that uh, microbial activity that could be, you know, taking place. So, all right. Okay, work in the soil, we pitch up our team of horses here, right? <coughs> um, you can work that into the top six inches. Uh, you know, roller tiller's good. A spade shovel works all right too, right? A little more labor intensive, but um, it does work in it, and it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't uh, do anything to the soil that's gonna hurt it, right? So, um, you know, for smaller areas, we're going to talk about raised beds in a minute. Um, you know, spade shovels, you know, might be the best way to do it. When I worked out at the prison, we did, just didn't have the fancy equipment. We had about two acres to garden, and just about every bit of it was with a shovel. So, and we grew, uh, you know, pretty amazing crops. Uh, you know, hundreds of pumpkins and lots of produce that we sent to the food. Uh, pantry here in town and trees and shrubs and all that stuff so are they still growing produce out there now that no i think it's kind of i think the prisoners are kind of do it individually but just to stay busy with the programs kind of done you know yeah so you know you can rent them uh parker's hardware you know rent so the bigger ones if you have a big area to, to rototill Maybe you can borrow one from somebody or whatever. So. Okay, this is something I was kind of excited about talking about. <coughs> There's a raised bed garden. <coughs> Anybody using those right now? Or? All right. Um, one thing I think I'll mention first before I you know, talk about these structures is just don't let, you know, the fact that you didn't have any lumber around or can't afford it this year or whatever, stop you from doing a raised bed garden. I mean, you can take and, you know, dig out around that and just mound it up. I've got an area that's 30 by 50 or something that I garden. It's just not practical to put, you know, um, all those boxes out there. Although I do, when I replaced all my windows, those frames were like, hey, these will work for raised beds. So all my windows are sitting in the garden. But but it is kind of low out there and um, doesn't warm up well in the spring. In fact, the summer before last, 
it was so wet that some of my tomatoes actually just died sitting there in the so after that year it was so wet I just took and wound it up in the middle for some of those things and boy that that really um, why didn't I think of that sooner kind of thing but, uh, really works well so I do that with just about everything except for my corn um, and some other things but um, so anyways uh, the thing that I like about these is that um, you can make up your own soil. If you're in that clay or sand, um, another thing that was funny out at the prison was um, that's predominantly sand through there and the guys would get leaves and I mean, they would get things from the kitchen. They would scrounge. I mean, they were good at scrounging and making do <laughs> it. They would throw it in a compost pile and they'd break it down and they'd throw it on the gardens. And after a year, I mean, that was still, they call that soil texture, but that soil was still sand. I mean, it's just amazing. You cannot change the texture. You should change the structure of the soil, but you can't change the texture of it. And, um, you know, it was just always sand, always will be sand. So, uh, which kind of brings me to the raised bed. You know, you, you know, you know uh, frame that in and bring in your own soil. You know, and quit fighting that clay and sand. So, um, if you could take something like this, go down to the you know compost place here in the sewer on Spruce Street, and just fill that right up. You know, or mix it with some good topsoil, good topsoil, um, or get some very well rotted manure like Boone's house out there on Six Mile Road. You'd have an awesome. I think you'd have an awesome start right there. So. Um, regardless of uh, you know how we did everything else so um, I put in there wood brick stone anybody have any unusual ways to do a raised bed or mm -hmm. interesting ways they want to share yeah yeah uh, my daughter just sent me something on the email that showed how to do um, how to use old uh, what are they called not flats pallets <laughs> it's a pallet garden where you can lean it up against a fence or you can lay it on the ground and you fill in all the holes with the pat make it sturdy first with little paneling nails so the wood is not all coming apart if it's old okay and then you take your fabric that comes in a roll okay for gardening and you double it up and then you just staple it all on the bottom and around the top of it a little bit. And then in every open slat, you put your good soil. And then you put a row of veggies, a row of flowers, a row of you know uh, herbs, whatever. And you can lean it up against the fence. You can um, leave it down on the ground if you have a spot and it would be sort of a raised bed kind of helps with the weed problem too it sounds like yeah you can plant your things close together and uh -huh. um, yeah. the only problem is watering it if you water from the top it doesn't always reach the bottom so you've got to mm -hmm. you know yeah, and you have to be careful with the pallets some are heat treated and mm -hmm. some are chemical treated mm -hmm. and the chemicals are not good you don't want to use the ones that have been I think she treated. she covered all of the wood um, where the soil would lay in it like if it was flat mm -hmm. on the ground um, all of the wood was covered with the uh, material that would not allow the soil to leave. Okay, so I'm not sure about, they didn't mention anything about chemicals. There's a, there's a little tractor symbol on them that you can check. It says either heat treated or off. Truck tire, tractor tire. Yeah. Chemical treatment. Yeah. 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 Old bells of hay will work too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are railroad ties then bad because of the chemicals mm -hmm. to use? Yeah, yeah. 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 you don't want to use it. Right so yeah. Okay. Yeah, plus once you get those things in your yard, you don't want it anymore. It's like, how are you going to lug this big thing out of here? <laughs> well, how do you rotate till that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. You don't. <laughs> well, the people really like the cool. idea of just turning some of those beds over with a shovel sometimes yeah. and not yeah. small. disturb it. Yeah, when it's small. Like my corn rows are 30 feet long, and there's five or six of those, so I use a dealer on that. But, um, yeah, for the smaller rows or raised beds, I just I use the shovel. So I heard something a little different this year. So I got tired of trying to dig up grass and do so. Or no, last year I got big sheets of cardboard and laid them out and just mounted the compost and everything on top. 
Now, I can't grow anything real deep right away, but eventually the you know, cardboard rot decomposed. And yeah. Yeah, I didn't have any edging, but I just kind of made the mound of hills on top of my cardboard. And yeah, did the weeds stay down pretty good? Yes, that the really helped because yeah. I've had a terrible time when I tried to dig out with weeds. I just, because my lawn yeah. is, I avoid the chemicals, so my lawn is not real pretty. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, Nancy. Uh, if anybody's seen the garden outside of Petal Branch, and that's how I did that whole flower bed. Mm -hmm. I didn't till that. There was burdocks, there was raspberry bushes, you name it. It was so ugly. I paid somebody to clean it up, and he, he gave up. He gave me my money back. <laughs> I said, how am I going to clean this up? <laughs> so I went out there with cardboard. I didn't till everything. I cardboard that whole lot, and then I put a little bit of soil on top and threw all the seeds in there. No weeds. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I didn't have one burdock. I didn't have one raspberry come through that cardboard, and Where it's been this? two years. Petals on Ashman? Yeah, petals on Ashman. Yeah, petals on Ashman if you get a chance this summer. My sister saw yeah. something on the internet. Yeah, in the back. <coughs> Layers. Well, yeah, there's a there's something to talk about here. <laughs> um, and yeah, maybe Carol's got some input for me, but um, you know, any of these, you know, contractors, you know, that do excavating and stuff can get soil for you. I see Jeannie shaking her head. Twenty two dollars a yard. You know. I can tell you what. Yeah, expensive. Like <laughs> and not always reliable as far as how good that mm -hmm. stuff will be. You know, they might hate to say it, but you know, they're gonna call it topsoil, but it'll be stony and sandy and clay and I got some sometimes from a farmer. maybe good enough for a lawn, but. I got some from a farmer and it was supposed to be the barnyard stuff, you know, and it was full of metal. <laughs> really? Wow. I broke a few shear pins <laughs> off my rototiller. <laughs> Farm, yeah. farm parts. <laughs> oh, man. Another thing to consider is you may be importing some weeds that you don't want, weed mm -hmm. seeds and yeah. invasive yeah. plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Can I add something to that? Yeah. I've been gardening for a long time and too bad my body gave out <laughs> when I learned everything. <laughs> but anywhere you get your soil, whether it be the compost or the farmer, or anything else that first year you're gonna have weeds like crazy mm -hmm. get yourself a scuffle hole just take a little bit off the top and just keep working it as long as you don't till that seeds back in again and again <coughs> you should be weed free within a year cool, use buddy. the cardboard between your rows to smother it mm -hmm. if I found out that since I bought the, the shop I'm not home I used to have some beautiful gardens out there but I haven't been home in three years. Mm -hmm. I decided get out there with that cardboard and I went down the pass where I can't go and the weeds are cropping up just to hold it until I'm home again soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just smother it with the cardboard. Yeah, and you, you really want to be careful with cardboard. Mm -hmm. Just be cautious. There, there's good cardboard and there's bad cardboard. And, and the devil's in what holds it together. The glue. So um, just a point that was brought up. You want to do things in sand, it takes more to hold it together. And there's one technique that works and that's lasagna gardening. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I'll just say that right there is a perfect example of a lasagna garden that you can mound up and, and just go nuts. And you use very little soil because you're layering those pieces of compost. And roots actually like to feather themselves out. Mm -hmm. And so remember what you're planting in those in that layered material. And then you'll be successful. Keep notes. Mm -hmm. What's amazing too is when you put that cardboard down, you get some compost over whatever uh, mulch. At the end of the year, towards the end of the year, you'll dig that up, and it's like a moist cake. I mean, it's just that. Soft. And the worms, the worms the are worms. just like tremendous. Yeah, yeah and all that microbial mm -hmm. action is taking place too. So, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. very good thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you do want to build it, I know Parker's Hardware, I was talking to them this week, maybe Lock City too, has, I know Parker does for sure though, has the, you know, angle brackets or whatever to put the boards in there. They didn't have real wide boards, maybe Lock City does. Um, Scott down there recommended cedar. The, the, the treated lumber does still have some, you know, it's treated, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be with uh, uh, whatever it was, arsenic that they had in it, but it's still, you know, got a chemical. So cedar would be a good option. And then of course, you can always go online or in these catalogs, they sell these vinyl types, I think, and then I've never used those. All these just seemed a little too pricey for me, but, um, but you know, they, they probably hold up pretty good, so. Um, there's good local cedar too. Uh, we put up some fence. We got some from Eagle Teen. I think it's a cedar shop. The cedar shop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I know there's some other people that have, uh, you know, local sawmills and stuff. They can get just untreated cedar. That's mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 There's, there's lots of white cedar out yeah. here. Some yeah. here. Yeah. 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 There's a whole pile yeah. of them. Yeah. 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 So well, there you go. That. And also, you know. I'm going to recommend if you're just starting out in gardening, you know, starting small, starting something like this. It's amazing what you can grow, how much you'll be able to grow just in, you know, an area that small. So. Mm -hmm. And that just showing another one there, I guess. But uh, two by ten, I was just referring to the lumber. I don't know what height they're going, eight, eight inches, ten inches, somewhere in there. This was a picture I took um, out in Brimley. These folks had a place, I know you've seen these kind of places around here a lot, you know, cabin out by the water, lots of trees, but they had one open area of sun, and right by the driveway. And you can't see this completely, but this is actually a raised bed that's standing about, you know, yay high, like a, like a workbench. And um, those are my tomatoes I gave them. Liberty tomatoes. I was kind of proud of that. Um, they, they grew them in that and just uh, they just did really well. Just a little bit of sun the last two years in a row, in fact. I think that's actually from the year before last, which wasn't the best tomato year. I think got another picture of that. What was the variety of tomatoes there again? Celebrity? Yeah. So, um, oh, we're at our intermission here. So. Um, yeah, we're going to do the raffle right now, I guess. I thought maybe this would be a chance to break this up a little bit. And, uh, um, you know, what do we actually do next? Well, we want to plant our seed. Um, I mean, this is sort of, should be self-evident, I guess, but, you know, you want to rake that out nice, get it nice and level, get all those clumps out. When we put the seed in, some of the very tiny get the large clumps out. Um, what became kind of a sort of a, I shouldn't say joke, but pet peeve in the prison was we don't walk in the aisles where we just killed. So it does, um, actually the prisoners got on me about that more than anybody. <laughs> uh, but it does make sense. I mean, it causes compaction. And we don't want that. Um, which is another thing too, you know, is you know, just, just keep in mind that, you know, tiller action, wheelbarrows, all that stuff. You know, try to get some pass. If you have a big garden, try to get some pass, use those, you know, try not to uh, trample over what was already tilled up. So it does make a difference. And all these things now, you know, that I'm gonna talk about are just you know, little things that added up will hopefully help you become successful. So um, okay, here's my my biggest thing that I that I like to emphasize is you know looking at the day of maturity on the seed packets. You know, really pay attention to this. You know the you know, gotta love them whatever, but the marketers they want to sell you seed, you, know, you get seed in Walmart, all these displays, it's all good. But you know they don't always know what it's like up here in the frozen <laughs> north, right? Um, 
There's a way I try to explain it, you know, when it fits at the CPAC it says 65 days maturity. They're talking about 65 good growing days maturity. We figure up here we got about 90 frost free days, but on average. But how many of those are good growing days, right? Where it's, you know, 55 at night or above, you know, 75, 80 at day in the daytime. I remember one summer they were having this contest who could who could name what day it was going to get up to 80 <laughs> and nobody won because it didn't get there so <laughs> um, in this area I, you know I, I usually look at 65 to 70 days on most seed packets so keep that in mind a lot of people are turning heirlooms and that's okay but some of those heirlooms were you know originally for you know the southwest United States that's why we have hybrids. Some of those hybrids are shorter season seeds. So, so I'm not saying don't plant heirlooms, but just keep that in mind at days of maturity. Some things are no problem. I mean, beans, onions, carrots, you know, they don't take a long season and they don't mind a little cool weather. So that's not a problem. But, you know, things like tomatoes, corn, squash, cucumbers, um, and a lot of your flowers, right? A lot of your flowers, 100, 105 days, things like that if you're planting from seed. So, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, and then just, you know, planting depth, that makes a difference on your germination. Um, you know, if you're planting in rows, you know, using a string, you know, just, just to mark the rows, make it, you know, sure your rows are straight, you're going that route. So what's the magic number to be safe up here in the days? I think around 67, you know, that's what you like. And that's what, in, for you folks that they got the corn packages, that's what that seed is. And that, that's been a reliable corn every single year for me. But, um, and then we'll, in a few minutes here, we'll talk about what to do if, you know, if you can't, absolutely can't find a short season. Uh, you know, vegetable, if you're doing that, um, or flowers, I guess, for that matter. What can you do? And there are some things we'll talk about there. What was um, the corn variety that you gave up? You've grown that here, too, then? Yeah, yeah. It's northern, really extra early. Extra sweet hybrid. Early extra sweet hybrid. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. from, from young. There's a couple others, you know, with sort of similar names. And about the same um, days of maturity. You know, corn's one of those things that people say, gee, you can't grow that up here. Well, you get the right uh, variety. Um, you know, they do like to be fed well and watered, you know, during the dry portion of the summer. Make sure the water's good. You should get corn. Boy, it's worth all the effort. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, fresh, sweet corn. Just nothing like it, you know. How many people, I don't want to get off on this too much, but how many people in the cities kids just have never tasted such a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So They didn't even know um, where their food comes from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and that's, you know, that's another reason why I like to do these workshops, you know, and we get more people doing this. I think we're, you know, everybody wants to be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is one ticket to, to, to doing it, you know. The other one, I guess, is still, but, <laughs> <laughs> this is one way to do it. Right? Um, so, you know, getting back to planting seeds, something my grandpa taught me, you know, just taking for the real tiny seeds like carrots, he would take a whole handle and just lay it down, lift it back up, and we, you know, because, because they're so, so shallow, you know, we do that. And then uh, these are just little tips I'm throwing in here. Make furrow only as deep as the package calls for. Cover with soil and pat down with the hand hole blade or for larger seeds your feet. You know, I walk down the rows on my carrots, or not my, I'm sorry, peas and corn. Um, <coughs> like carrots, I'm usually kind of patting with my hand. So the important thing is, is, is consider seed, um, soil, and moisture contact. A good, you know, seed to soil contact. That's what you want to do. So. Any questions there? Or kind of throwing out a few things here. But. Um, and then of course, we want it watered and good. Um, 
you know, sometimes days or you know, even a couple weeks go by, it doesn't rain, you've planted your seed, maybe it was moist when you planted, but now it's not. Um, here's a nice little tip here, though, that's something else my grandpa kind of taught me, I guess, with um, after seedlings emerge. You know, if you can, you know, that first few times, water with warm water, if you can, it really, really does make a difference. Um, cold water can, can shock young seedlings. We had that, we found that out in the greenhouse one year. <coughs> we would take the flats of petunias and we'd, we'd bottom water, which was really an effective way to do it. We'd dump them in there, we'd pull them out, and the petunias were dying. And prisoners are suspicious of each other. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine, right? They were pretty sure somebody came in at night or something and was sabotaging what they were doing. And they were almost, you know, duke it out mad, you know. And I said, well, why don't we look at some other things, you know? So, actually, I called a guy downstate who's been in this longer than I had. He said, well, they do like that warm water. So, just dipping them into that cold water was shutting them back. So, yeah. I've also just put my water source in the windowsill so mm -hmm. that it's room temperature when I either spritz or drizzle or whatever your can or spray bottle is. Just mm -hmm. simply put it in the windowsill to warm the sun will keep at the right temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Again it's you know, it's these little things that you know kinda add up to the reason why using your well water is not always good because right. it's too cold. It's so cold, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could warm mm -hmm. that up. Once the plants get going, you know, and summer gets a little warmer, you know, it's just not going to hurt so much. I'm not suggesting, you know, that you have to put water on the stove every time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, the early going, you know, even with small flowers, you know, if you had a rain barrel and, you know, just doesn't have to be hot, just, you know, same temperature as the air, you know, a room. <coughs> Raise your hand. Jenny? I, I line my deck with those plastic watering cans, you know, and they have them on sale at the end of the season. And I fill oh. them every time I I just keep them all full and they stay warm. You know? yeah. So yeah. My yeah, raised beds on the deck, I water with those and yeah. Yeah, sure does. make sure it's plastic going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So, and then of course, uh, you know, keep things watered. Um, Another little tip, you know, I know we're talking about some different situations if you're, some people have said they plant inside uh, in the spring. I know people kind of have some problems with that sometimes, you know, plants get spindly or whatever. Um, something we kind of learned in the greenhouse out there too was, and I think this would apply just about anywhere, water well, then kind of let it dry out. As those plants dry out, the roots want to expand, and that's a good thing. You know, if they're saturated all the time, those roots have no reason really to expand to, to get water and, and develop more. So um, that's really a good uh, way in the greenhouse, or you know, if you're planting things early inside, it's a really good way to to start to get a nice, or, you know, to get a nice uh, root ball form. So that really is kind of the foundation of the plant. So if you think from the bottom up. Thing. Okay, weeding, I think we've covered this a little bit, but, um, so I just kind of put it this five step, I don't know, I hope you don't ever look like this guy, <laughs> Maybe just giving up, you know, and beating the crap out of it, but um, hopefully we, you know, we can, I think this is a major problem and, you know, or it can be. Um, one year at the, the uh, community garden, I rented a plot. I didn't really need another plot. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to be in town gardening with people and stuff. And I knew I wouldn't be able to get there and to weed it much. So, you know, I just planted the rows and then I had my plants, you know, everything spaced about right. And then, you know, like Nancy was talking about, of course, in this case, I put down paper, newspaper, about four or five sheets. And then I, they had some uh, wood bark down there, so I put that over top. And boy, I did very little weeding that, that year. So, um, you know, the cardboard and the newspaper really does work. Straw, um, you know, don't use hay because of the weed seed in it, but 
Straw is another good one. The problem with straw is it's you know, expensive. I never found a way around that. I'm not a farmer, so. Um, Save your leaves. Leaves work really good, too. Yeah, leaves. Um, I used yeah. to um, white pine needles one year because I had a huge white pine in my uh, front yard and we're always raking them up. And somebody later told me that that's bad for gardening, but I'll tell you what, it was great mulch. Yeah. It, it really, my garden was great that year. It really does suppress the weeds pretty mm -hmm. well, doesn't it? Yeah, I think they're selling that now, I think, in the bay or some places. Yeah. And I don't know, I've heard that it kind of lowers the acidity. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know they use it around blueberries, so. Um, but I don't think, you know, lowering the acidity would be a bad thing with flowers anyway, so, and I don't think it would be lowering it enough to cause any problems, so, yeah, that's a good one if you've got that. Um, and it just kind of mats when you lay it down, so it's a couple inches and you've got pretty good suppression of leaves there, so. Um, you know, and if you can get in the habit of maybe forming some kind of a pile, you know, with your grass clippings and your, you know, maybe you've, uh, you know, maybe you've pulled up some things out of the garden or whatever, you can, you know, use that, plus it starts to compost. We won't get into composting too much, but, so we early and often, um, you know, like I say, for the bigger gardens, you know, it's a little bit different situation. You might have to use some mechanical means, at least I have to. <laughs> I, just, I guess I don't have patience to, to layer my whole garden with, with with that. Maybe I should, but it's a lot of cardboard, so <laughs> I till between the rows of my corn. When you talk about plant spacing too, I have a garden that's about 30 feet by maybe 50, and um, I tried to plant too much one year, and I did um, climbing beans. Okay, Kentucky mm -hmm. Wonder Beans on sticks. Okay, made tents. Mm -hmm. And they molded because they they were so close together that they really? didn't get yeah. enough sunlight. Air. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a pretty rainy year, I don't remember now, but mm -hmm. they all molded. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you keep things spaced. Um, okay, planting from transplants. Um, has anybody done this before, planting, you know, tomatoes, peppers? Um, pretty simple process. I think sometimes, you know, if you're new at it, though, you don't think of some things. You know, of course, you want to prepare your soil like you, we've been talking about tonight. Maybe a little hole. I like to put the water in first, put the plant in. I don't, I used to kind of scuff up the roots, but I don't anymore. I think that just disturbs them. And even if they're root bound, I don't think it's a real good idea. I think it's best just to put that in there. Um, I, tomatoes, I've done a lot yeah. of experimenting when you said that. And I know by even taking care of green plants in the house, if you cut that root ball, let's say you get a transplant and it's a hard, take the scissors and do it. And I always mix up a real, real week of miracle Grow. I soak my plants in that just before I put them in the garden. And when you when you cut it like that, what happens is you get new roots growing up within a couple of days and, and oh, your plants take right God. off. So I've done it both ways and I'd say cut that root ball. How many times you looked in the garden and here's that little mat root ball still at the same size, mm -hmm. not doing anything all summer long or at the end of the summer, you can still see it if you don't mm -hmm. so tease, the, tease yeah, well, I just take the scissors, yeah, cut a little bit. Yeah, soak it and you get and you really if you were to pull it out every so many days and look you'd see those new roots coming out of that and I think the difference between roughing it with your fingers and cutting it is the same concept as how you cut clean cut flowers you're cutting it and it opens it rather than yeah. bruising it if yeah. you were to snap it mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah. it does yeah. 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 and and let me point out that root structure Nancy is is, is exactly that it multiplies and the key is a clean knife mm -hmm. and very sharp. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to uh, bruise it, you want to cut it. And then the other thing, the, just a little caveat, is vitamin B uh, complexes. 
um, are stimulant growth stimulants. So uh, those two things uh, will get you success. All right, extra tips there. Um, yeah, warm water again if you can. Um, if you're doing a lot of petunias though, Nancy, what do you think? I mean, if you were doing flats and flats, do you, you think you would cut every one or just put them in? I know Michigan State had a study where they said it didn't seem oh, to make It takes you a minute, you just plug them yeah. out, soak them a little bit. Because right. guess what? It, it, it's what's that term where you uh, you don't take a ten dollar plant and put it in a penny hole? I mean, you mm -hmm. want to take that extra mm -hmm. yeah. because our season's so short. You want to take yeah. extra so care yeah. to mm -hmm. get it in there. Yeah. And when you're transplanting too, if you can shade the stuff, <coughs> if you can um, shade it for a couple days, it won't go in that transplant. And make sure you go out there and water it. How many of us have gone got, got a, a flat of flowers, taken it home, left it in the car, left it on the sidewalk? <laughs> Next day you go out there and they're all. You've got to go home, stick them under the shade, give them a drink of water. If you can't yeah. get to planting them and frost free yeah. too, yeah. but you have to give them those. You have to give them a chance. Well, one of the things that happens every year is we, in in this community, we plant the gardens out in the spur, we do other things. And we lay those plants under a tree at the industrial park and they just sit there. <laughs> and what we could be doing is putting putting them in a in a source where their roots are gonna grow. Yeah. Just like you're just yeah. saying. Yeah. Give them every opportunity to do better. Yeah. And will grow too. Water. Yeah. And you're I mean, transplanting water's the key too. You just yeah. you just can't plug it in there and walk away for five days. You mm -hmm. transplant them they need. Yeah. And compost and sucks yeah. water. It's like yeah. a sponge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, mulching around them too really you know, if you're doing setting out cabbage, you know, things like that. Lettuce, you know, mulching keeps that moisture in good, so When the plant, make sure the snow is on. Yeah, the snow is on. Right? Um, I plan to plant in snow this year, actually. So I it's my awesome. experiment. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure how you came up out of the four feet of snow. How do you decide when to plant? Um, well, Okay, there's some. I pretty much, I mean, you know, to some extent you go by the weather, you know, when it comes to vegetables. Um, and to some extent you're going by the calendar. And the reason I say that is you can't wait too long. Um, so it's kind of a tricky trade off, right? Um, but here in, in, in general, you know, late April, early May, you know, depending on the weather, of course. You know, you could put in, in some of these things listed. Um, and then mid-May, I said potatoes plus any of the above. You know, so if it just looks like it's still going to be too cold um, late April, early May, you know, you're certainly not going to, you know, lose too much if, if you wait till mid-May. I do say potatoes because potatoes are a little bit sensitive to the frost. I put them in about mid-May, maybe people do it differently, but if they're coming up, I'll just mound dirt right over the leaves, um, real easy way to cover them, and, and it doesn't bother them at all. So um, so this is pretty much my schedule, you know, give or take. Um, I don't follow the movement or anything, but <laughs> this is what I try to do. Um, and like I say, it's a little bit based on, you know, the timing, how much timing we're going to need. Um, do some research though, you know, um, uh, in the books for individual vegetables, you know, this is just sort of a general guide, um, you know, do your homework. But these things here, sweet corn, summer and winter squash, pumpkin, tomatoes and peppers, um, that would be right here. 
should be around the first of June if we're going to have time enough to, you know, harvest, uh, you know, red red tomatoes and squash and so forth. So, um, and here's something I want to mention here before I forget. Um, our tomatoes and peppers, of course, are going to come as transplants and we're going to, you know, grow our own and put them in. So that's not a real big problem. Sweet corn, you know, the first of June should be, you know, enough time if you use a shorter uh, season corn. Um, but pumpkin squash, um, there's a third one I'm not thinking of right now, but um, need a little help. There's not too many that are 67 days, 70 days, it's more like pumpkin, I think, you know, like 90 would be the least uh, days. So what you could do, I mean, I've got grow lights and so forth, but I think even in a window, a south facing or east facing window for pumpkin, if you could just, you know, fill these, pack this kind of nice and firm with some potting soil, um, and put in your pumpkin seed, you know, maybe just one or two in there, get a little boost, um, you know, maybe do this, you know, after the first week in May, somewhere in there, get a little start, don't let it get too big, and then put that out. I mean, pumpkin and squash, we're gonna need a little help probably, um, especially pumpkin, but we have grown some pretty nice ones. Out to prison, we had these tents that went over them. Um, you know, in the early spring, it kept the wind, cold wind off them. We had hundreds that we, I see Joanna left, but that we had given some pickers for their uh, uh, community days or whatever they had out there, so. Um, but th this, here's your season extending ideas. Uh, you know, start it in here, you put it out around the 1st of June, you dig a hole, you put lots of compost in there if there's not already lots of compost in it, mound it up a little bit, get this on, you're, you're trying to take, you know, that 67 days or whatever, you know, and extend that, or make up for it, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, you know, you still might want to put some sort of a cover over it, a heat cap. I should have brought one of those, but I had those, one of those big Lipton tea jugs just to put over it, a little wind protection early on. Be a little careful, you don't leave it on too long. I mean, once it does get hot or warmer, um, you know, it can kind of burn it. Yeah, okay. With those covers, do you go out and check every day to see when it's too warm, or you just leave them on? For well, yeah, days? yeah, keep, make sure there's some ventilation on it, on the cover. It doesn't, you know, you could do like, even like a V, you know, on the side of it. I wish I would've brought one of those, but, you know, think of a milk, gallon milk jug, maybe, you know, with a V kind of cut in it, or maybe something out of the top. Tomatoes, um, one suggestion I had, Organic Gardening Magazine used it, but um, it was just a fence around it. I laid it down, it was about yay big. Put a garbage bag over it, cut the garbage bag out at the top, pinned it down and around. That was good just to keep the cold winds from it, kind of warmed it up a little bit. Um, you know, that's an idea. Hopefully we're not gonna have that kind of summer when we have to do it. <laughs> um, that goes back to the days of maturity, you know, and, and you know, be careful in your greenhouses. I think locally you should be able to find, you know, some short season uh, varieties. Um, determinate are a little bit, you know, better to grow than indeterminate when it comes to tomatoes. Indeterminates kind of grow and grow and grow. And for this climate, you know, I think it's a little better to have a determinate tomato where it's gonna stop and start setting fruit, you know, before our season's over, so. I think with tomatoes, you all, how many people have grown tomatoes? <laughs> yeah, I think you all know how, you know, kind of a short window period we have there to get those ripened, so. Are um, these dates all from seed then, not from transplants? Um, this would be, yeah, this would be from seed up here, although you could have cauliflower, lettuce, and broccoli could be from transplants also. That early? Yeah, you could, or a little bit later even. Um, you know, that's about as early as you'd want to start it. Um, and then down here, um, you know, your pumpkin and winter squash, you know, you might... Oh, I want to mention this. Um, the reason I favor these is because you can cut these out and set them right in the ground without disturbing the roots. I know the greenhouses are selling a lot of the big vine plants, and I've never been real fond of that. 
I think when you pull them out, the vine plants, that, that they lose, you lose a lot. Mm -hmm. So I like to just set these in, uh, you know, and then of course this will degrade by itself, so. Um, and then beans, the, the big problem with beans, of course, they germinate real quickly, and if you still have a frost, they're real sensitive to frost, so you want to wait till, you know, more like around uh, June 10th. And of course, you know, we're talking weather here, so you're watching the weather forecast. And uh, I think one of the big things to be careful of up here, and I've seen people do it, is maybe the first of May does come along and then it's just beautiful, you know, and you get this week and everybody's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I get to the beautiful. Plant that weekend, you know, okay, and then, uh oh, you know, we got that big thing coming down from Canada or whatever, and you know, what do they call it? Uh, jet stream or whatever it's cold weather and a frost <coughs> so that's why i say dates all right Mina, dates versus weather you know you, you have to kind of uh, think of both yeah Mina. i can't grow a decent radish what are some tips for getting a good radish <laughs> oh boy they're usually wormy for one thing and, and last year they removed the tops and i was so excited and pulled them up in the bottom so mm -hmm. space them good you know and when you plant, you know, make sure you're really spacing that. That seed is small too, and space that seed out. Um, I know people talk a lot about the worms. I've never had those. Maggots are, are, maggots are, are uh, essentially beetles, and they're in the soil already. So disturb the soil, solarize it, they come out of the soil, it won't be a problem. As as much but get your get a, uh, try moving your your material to another spot that's what I would say and also compost 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 so pH uh, it will change the, the character will change what the, the insects like or don't like yeah, I think moving them too is good. Kind of well, I, I rotate my stuff every year. That's my new planting. Yeah, like a senior planting or something. Okay. Yes. If it's drying, you know, it's like that to the maybe there's something that you plant with the radishes that'll deter that, you know, like. Yeah, I'm not or sure what. Uh, maybe marigolds, I'm not sure though. But mm -hmm. yeah, you might try that. Yeah. I've used uh, bed sheets uh, if, if you have like tomatoes and you get a frost or whatever and you have your tomato, um, what do you call them, yeah. the wire baskets on them, you can, you can throw a sheet over it and prevent the frost from getting to it. Yeah, you know, if you do, you know, have some things coming up, you plan your garden, sometimes you just get that even, you know, that, that Close frost in the middle yeah. of June even. Yeah, if you can get, uh, cover it. Well, here's a couple of things to talk about real quick. You know, you could cover it, like she says, with the bed sheets. Make sure, you know, it's not touching the plant. Any kind of thing, you know, that, that you could put over without touching the plant. And the other thing I've done successfully is, and I think Marcy, uh, our uncle Shorty, right, Marcy, taught me this one, but, uh, 94 now, but he'd go out very, very early in the morning before the sun come up in water mm -hmm. and essentially water that frost off the plants and that, that works. So, so you know, all is not lost, um, you know, if we do have a frost. Corn, you know, I found that that, that can take a minor frost, so, and of course, some of these other things can take a frost. These things right up here, you know, all can take a, you know, at least a light frost. So but these things, you know, most of these things down in here are very sensitive, so. Have you heard of putting cans in the soil under your, like when you plant, like taking out the top and the bottom of a tin can and putting it into the soil a little bit and your, your root down through that to prevent bugs and, bugs and that, frost yeah. and. I've never done that, but anybody done know. that? I've heard of that, I don't know if it yeah. works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You put cucumbers uh, in with the squash and pumpkins category? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's what I was missing. Cucumbers, so. Mm -hmm. Another thing, speaking of cucumbers, is, you know, 
pay attention to the, you know, what soil, you know, warmth, temperature requirements are of the cucumbers are very sensitive to the seed, you know, to uh, germinate well in cold uh, soil, so keep that in mind too. <coughs> soil temperature is usually, a lot of times in the seed pack it'll say, you know, plant when soil temperature is 60 or above, well how do you know that? Without a, generally speaking, soil temperature is about 10 degrees cooler than the air, 10 to 12 degrees, so, um, you know, keep that in mind, so. Um, tomatoes, another sort of tip is, you know, sometimes we get anxious to get the tomatoes out. They really don't, you know, unless the temperature is above 55, I believe it is, they don't do anything. You know, maybe they're establishing root a little bit, but they're just not growing, so, you know, don't get too anxious to get some things like that out, because they're just not going to do anything anyways, right? Okay, and just kind of quickly here, proper spacing, remember that. Um, carrot seed, you know, I, I used to have that problem of, you know, just putting too much in and then it's really hard to thin it. <laughs> so, uh, there's these little green things you can buy now that are just a real cheap, that'll help your plant, you know, if you see those old plastic planters. Uh, tomatoes, we talked about that. Um, good soil to seed contact. Make sure, you know, that, that soil's pressing in nice around the seed so you have that contact. Plant cucumbers in hills. Uh, use raised beds, or I say three foot. I mean, that's just a general thing, but three foot wide mounds in wet areas. Like I said, you don't always need the lumber and that stuff. You know, even if you can mound it up, it can help a lot. Um, make sure not to plant heat clubbing plants like cucumber when it's cold out, soil's cold, don't flatten too soon or too late. I'll let you be the judge of that, I guess. The season extending ideas, we talked about these a little bit, but you know, here's a possibility, you know, mm -hmm. the English use these, they call them glass washes. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, you know, anything you can think of that, that would, uh, mm. you know, give them a little more heat. Uh, the peat pots I really like because you can start them and not disturb the roots. The hoops, uh, Johnny's Seed, I've got a catalog here, Johnny Select Seed sells um, hoop vendors, I think for about $60. You buy the conduit or hoops locally from your electrical supply places put them in, they sell you all the hardware you need there, you put those in, you're essentially putting a cover over. Um, you can do this, you know, in a small hoops, or of course some people are going bigger and in regular hoop houses. Um, I know we had, uh, there was a workshop about that a couple of weeks ago, which they've gone to, but um, some people are going, you know, with full scale hoop houses. Um, but that's, you know, just an option. You can go as big or small as you want. That's that's a nice thing, I guess. So, um, and then the other thing is um, is a floating row cover. The catalog sell those. Those are nice to use too, especially over the vine crops. You could lay it over the vine crops. It's just like a cheesecloth. And actually, it's pretty durable. You buy it; it's good for years. It's not real expensive. You know, it comes like three foot wide. You know, by however long you want it, however big a roll you want to buy, you can lay that out. Put a little dirt around the sides to keep it in, and just gives the you know there again just gives the plants a little bit of a warm up. Um, can help protect from bugs too. So, some reference books. This is probably my really impartial on or partial on one of these books, but. <laughs> 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 Seriously, I think these are four books, or at least three, that, that would really be good for this area. Um, if you're into organic gardening, I mean, this is practically the Bible here in the middle. You know, if, if you wanted some tips on growing in a northern region, my book. And then I really like the perennials and the annuals from Michigan. Um, they're Michigan authors. It's, it's a nice, just a real nice reference. And in the back, there's a nice reference to that. Looks at all your flowers, where to plant, you know, sun, shade, you know, dry, wet, whatever. Um, real nice books. So I think, you know, with those books, you can, you can hardly go wrong with flowers or 
vegetables or organic gardening. So, how many people are kind of call themselves organic gardeners? How many people use organic gardening methods? Maybe it's kind of me. I use organic gardening methods. I don't. I'm not strictly organic, but. And then uh, keep in touch if you you know have any questions. Um, you know I love helping people out and I like to see people be successful gardening. Um, I've got a blog, northcountrygardening.blogspot.com. There's a new magazine out called Michigan Gardening. It's at uh, Book World here. I've got some articles in there, and then online I have my blog. It's online at that site. Um, you can email me anytime, and then I've got. And thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it.